with our scripture readings for this fourth Sunday after Pentecost that highlight this reminder that the need for repentance. And again, friends, no one is above it. No one is above it. Not even the king, the leader of Israel. David had fallen into a trap. He had power, prestige. He had a harem. Okay, back in that day, the establishment of a, a kingdom with a king and dealing with other foreign nations was alliances. And part of that alliance was a lot of kings would present their daughters or other nieces or whatever the case might be to other kings to assure that alliance. So one of the reasons why God had always told the nation of Israel, no, I'll be your king, I'll be your God, and they, they threw their temper tantrum, they did their things, and the king of Israel was established. Well, David's now in that line, and he's got this harem, right? He's got these different wives, but he falls into a trap. He sees a woman bathing, realizes it's the wife of one of his great generals, and he comes up with a plan. That's easy. I'll put him in the front lines. He'll be killed. I'll take her as my wife. This is after, of course, an improper relationship, and she's now found to be a child to cover this all up. These are the steps that King David did, but he figures he's the king. But God in love sends the prophet to him, and in this little story, he realizes he's that one, he's that man. So whether we're a king of a nation, a king in our household, or a simple servant, we need to look. We need to look at our sins. We need to look at our lives and never be too proud to say, I am that man. I am that one. And to repent. Faith is repentance. Second Samuel eleven twenty six, we begin. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. But the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took that ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, that man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word, the Lord, by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Then David said to Nathan, 
I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But, because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. Here ends our first reading. Our second lesson is the epistle reading taken from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Reading the second chapter, verses 11 to 21. This is also our sermon text for today. When Caiaphas, also called Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Caiaphas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, We Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Here ends our epistle reading. A verse of the day taken from our psalm. Hallelujah! May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. Alleluia! Dear friends, we stand in respect to the Holy Gospel. Our Lord gives us through the Gospel writer Luke. We're reading the seventh chapter, beginning at the 36th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. Again, our Gospel account highlights that, that, that reminder sometimes of the appreciation of the Gospel. When I see it maybe waning in my life, maybe I need to take a harder look at the mirror of the law and realize really, truly how great and grievous my sins are. Right? Truly understand how incredibly huge and awesome Christ's love for me really is. We read from Luke 7. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One one owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Now neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. 
You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here ends the Gospel reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends. Again, as I mentioned, the word of our Lord upon which we want to base our meditation this morning is taken from that epistle reading where the Apostle Paul, led by guidance of the Holy Spirit, not in any kind of superior way, had to face down the great Apostle Peter. Caiaphas also was his name. Peter, remember him? He was the quick-to-react disciple. He's the one who jumped out of the boat when he heard Jesus coming. Got to walk on water for a few minutes. Then he lost his way. Sunk down. Jesus had to reach out, grab him, put him back in the boat. Peter was the one who grabbed out his sword and struck off the servant's ear in the garden trying to defend Jesus. Jesus said, no, Peter, put it away. Peter's one that sadly, tragically, fulfilled Jesus' prophecy how he would deny him three times before the rooster would crow. And it happened. Peter was burdened with guilt because of that. But you remember what Jesus did? After his resurrection, while he was appearing, remember what Jesus did? Had that beautiful breakfast on the beach. Sat with his disciples. Then he called Peter over and Peter and him had a little quick talk. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Peter, feed my sheep. Right? Three times Peter denied him. Three times Jesus came back and said, Peter, you love me? And restored him. Right? This, this is now the Peter that Paul had to put right on the right track again. Right? Get him on the right path. Because not even the great Apostle Peter, nor the great Apostle Paul, nor any of us, walks a perfect line. We don't. It's that balancing act. Remember as a kid sometimes, walking on the tracks. You shouldn't do that nowadays. You hear so many things going on. But... There were those days, right, as kids, you walk on that track and you balance, see how far you could get down on the, the track without following, and turn it into a competition. In, in a sense, friends, isn't that our walk with Jesus sometimes? It's a balancing act. The, 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 the goal is, is to use the law the right way. To stay balanced. To, to let that law of God summarized by the Ten Commandments be those beautiful words of guidance and instruction that the Lord gives to us. Our communicant members are reminded, right? Use the law as that mirror. Reflect on that law in preparation for celebrating the Lord's Supper so that you come with a repentant heart to use the mirror of the law, right? And we use that by focusing and saying, how, how well was my guide? How, how, how did I use the law as a guide this past week, these past couple of weeks? Did I do a perfect job keeping God number one every day, every instance of my life? Yeah, not so much probably. 
Did I honor God? My lips, with my mouth, did I give Him all praise? Right? Did I remember His name, use His name the right way to pray praise and give thanks? Or did I curse, swear, lie, deceive, practice superstition? Well, I maybe curse, lie, but I don't think I practiced superstition, did I? Well, if at any time you said good luck, have your lucky number or anything else, guess what? That's superstition. Right? And we can go on and on, friends. We can go on and on looking at all the commandments and realizing we don't measure up. We do not measure up. But today, the Apostle Paul, not because he was better than Peter in any way, and in fact, he's not even bringing this subject up to embarrass Peter. Because after this event, Peter and Paul became again apostles with the same focus. And they all needed continual reminders. Paul wasn't perfect. Paul had his days, just like we have our days. But, but it was that reminder, and again, I, the, the, the tie-in also of coming off of our 4th of July celebration, rejoicing in the freedoms that we have, friends. We have incredible freedoms in this nation. Is it a perfect nation? No, we won't even go there. But we enjoy freedoms. But do we have the freedom to do whatever we want? No, of course not, right? There is moral right and wrong. There are the civil laws that are there for our protection, right? To help us. So we don't have freedom to do whatever we want. But when we walk with Christ, we do when we understand it the right way. Just going to highlight verses 19 to 21 in our reading from Galatians here. The Apostle Paul reminds us, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. In those words and with the example that the Apostle Paul set forth to the believers in Galatia, he reminds us all that we need to stand firm in the freedom of the gospel. To stand firm in that freedom because Satan loves to twist and warp the truth and confuse us Almost to the point that we today gathered here can think, well, we're we're better Christians than the ones that aren't here. First Sunday in July, 4th of July weekend, 4th of July on Thursday, some had a really long weekend. I know some members, they're they're, they're on trips, they're they're traveling, thankfully, again, sharing and everything, and yet sometimes you say, well, look at us. We're here. We're here on Sunday. Good job. We win. We're the better Christians. Just that simple example, friends, can get us in a lot of trouble. Right? We need to make sure we're standing firm on the gospel freedom that says, whether I'm in church or out of church, I'm saved. Because, see, it has nothing to do with what you and I do, what we have done, or even what we will do. There is no partnership. There is no us working together that Christ saved us almost, but now there's that part we have to do. Uh-uh. No, stand firm in the gospel freedom. We're free. We are free from the chains of sin, death, and the devil. We're free. There is nothing Satan can do to grab us and drag us down to hell. We're free. Jesus has won that victory in battle. There is nothing you and I can do to get in a higher, better place in heaven. Christ has done it all. We need to stand firm in that freedom. See, that's where we receive this encouragement because it's a challenge. It's a challenge because there are those times where, well, of course God loves me. Look at those other people out there. 
Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're behaving. Come on, God. I've done good this week. A few bonus points. A few stars, right? When we fall into that trap of comparing ourselves with others, hands down, God's going to love us. No. One sin is all it takes. One sin in my head, my heart, through a word, through an action, and I'm despised and hated by a holy, righteous God. All it takes is one sin. That's it. But that's the beauty of the cross. Christ came and washed away that one and all the other sins so that when God looks at us, He sees us as righteous, holy children. Friends, He sees us as He saw that woman that night in Simon's house. He looks at us. He says... Your faith has saved you. Not your actions, not your deeds. Right? It wasn't her actions. It wasn't the fact that she was wetting his feet with her tears. It wasn't the fact she took an expensive bottle of perfume and poured it on his feet. Though those actions were expressions of love on her part, that's not what saved her. That's not what made her righteous in God's eyes. Those were the fruits of faith. That was her heart pouring out knowing Jesus had come to save her. The Holy Spirit had worked that faith and she was reacting to that faith going, heaven is my home because of what Christ has done for me. Heaven is my home because of what Jesus has done. Pure joy and love and appreciation was poured out that day. And Jesus highlighted. That's gospel freedom. And that's what you and I need to stand firm on every day. Don't give up meeting together. You you, you hear me express and say that all the time. We have a wonderful, joyful purpose in gathering together on a regular basis. In Hebrews 10, the Lord reminds us of the blessing of having a church family. Again, God's blessing us today. In just a few moments, we're going to welcome in six new members. What a a blessing to have this opportunity to have a body of believers where we know we can come and gather here, worship together, join in praise, join in prayer, support each other, encourage each other. But please, as the pastor of this congregation, I will highlight this very clearly. Our church membership, not even our church attendance, saves us. It doesn't. Faith saves. Faith saves. Now, Coming to church, worshiping, helps strengthen that faith that saves us. So doing this is a good thing. Gathering together to build each other up, to encourage each other. Gathering together to remind ourselves out there is a war. It's a battle going on, a spiritual war. And we come in here and we get fixed up. We get bandaged up, right? If a church becomes like a country club where membership has great privileges and and, and we're all prideful, we got a problem. If our church is like a mass unit, bandaging up, fixing up the soldiers and then sending us back out there, then that's our purpose, right? That, That we understand this is why we gather together, to build each other up, standing firm in the freedom of the gospel. That I am free because of what Christ has done, plain and simple. Now what I want to do isn't to go out and do whatever I want and break every law because it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Of course it matters. Right? That's why Jesus says, be the salt of the earth. That's why Jesus says, let your light of faith shine out. Our behavior and our actions matter in the right way. But we always need to make sure we're standing firm in the freedom of the gospel that declares this important, incredible truth. Jesus came. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus suffered on that cross for the sins of the whole world, including yours and mine. And we are set free from the bondage of sin, death, and Satan because of what He did. That's the gospel message. Heaven is our home because of what Christ has done. 
May we always stand firm in that wonderful gospel truth. And may that gospel truth encourage us to support and build each other up. Yeah, even if we have to get in each other's face like Peter and Paul had to do. It was done in love. Sometimes you have to say, hey, what are you doing? Is that a good thing to do? To encourage each other, build each other up. Right? But let us make sure we're doing it for the right reasons in the right way. And we do that by staying focused on what the gospel means for us. Standing firm. Standing sure in that freedom that is ours. Receiving the forgiveness that God gives to us. And taking that truth with us everywhere we go. Let's not build up other rules. Let's not build up other walls, as Paul references there. No, those walls have been torn down. No more hypocrisy. We live in the freedom of the gospel. We live in that truth every day. To God be the glory. Amen. May that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.